Bonjour. Welcome to another edition of Café de René. I am the third wheel, James Tunstall, joined once again by the star show, Mr. René Free. René, who you brought today? I brought a very special guest. Uh, I first met him, I believe, in 2006 at the Gold's Gym in McDonough, Georgia. Yep. For sure. Deep South Wrestling. And looks like... Uh, he still visits the gym quite often because he's jacked as ever at the tender age. Can I tell you, can I tell the people your age? Go right ahead. 52 years of age. He's jacked. And uh, look at that. God, man, making me look bad, buddy. <laughs> so no. David Kid Cash, an ECW original. And uh, when I was going to, you know, do this podcast, I started looking up some of your stuff, man. It's like, I didn't realize how fucking great you really were man god oh. you do cool shit thank you appreciate yeah. it yeah so what's been going on man where are you at uh knoxville tennessee uh, uh-huh. i'm a project superintendent for a national uh commercial construction company travel around building high rises and hotels and things of that and malls just whatever and stuff like that uh still uh doing some wrestling here and there i don't wrestle in the ring anymore i just had a hip replacement back in uh, november so probably the wrestling is not a good idea for me right now (laughs) but i'm back to squatting again you know i can squat again uh just had it back in november so i'm uh i'm back up to like 245 250 on squat again and i didn't i wasn't able to do legs for over two years because of my hip was so bad yeah i couldn't do anything so from November to just uh, probably about three weeks ago, I'm doing legs again. So uh, what I'm doing now is I'm doing some indie shows and stuff, uh, you know, down in Georgia and Tennessee here. But I'm uh, kind of reinventing myself a little bit. Um, I'm a manager now, doing managing, kind of helping out, you know, giving back to the younger guys. I, I get with these other promoters. They get their top guys, you know, that that are talented wrestlers, but of course, all the new young guys, you know, always need promo work. They need character work. They need, you know, they, they need the in-ring work, too, along with the high-flying moves. They also need that in-between stuff. So I kind of like on-the-job train them and be their manager, you know. Wow. And I'm sort of a cross between uh, probably Paul Ellering and, uh, I don't know, I, I would probably, <laughs> I don't want to say, uh, what's his name, fuck, uh, God damn it. Um, glasses. Shit. Har- Jim Harvey Wilson? Oh, Jim Cornette. Oh, Jim Cornette. Cornette. Yeah. oh Jesus. <laughs> well, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm, you never lose the heel attitude. So it, that's where the Jim Cornette comes in with the microphone talk. And then the, you know, the Paul Ellering comes in with, I'm a little more jacked than most managers. So, right. uh, and I, but I don't get involved, you know, I, I kind of use uh, the brains and psychology, teach these guys psychology, you know. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I've been doing. I don't I only do that a couple of times a month, you know, but uh, I'm still involved. Yeah. Well, it's, you know how it is, man. Once it's in your blood, man, it's, it's the biggest addiction that there is, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I retired in uh, 2015, and uh, I think oh. – about a year later, uh, a guy named Ronnie Gossett down in Georgia. Uh, yes. Yeah, I think you might have worked for him before. Uh, he was doing some TV stuff, and uh, Kevin Sullivan and all those guys were involved with it. You know, Buff Bagwell, a lot of guys were involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I went down and did some stuff before my hip got really too bad. But um, whenever it did get bad, I started running their dressing room for them, you know, for their TV tapings, you know, giving them their times and kind of being an agent you know, listening to their matches and giving them a little helpful hints and uh, being a little stern, you know, they, you know, young guys are, they don't know their times very well. <laughs> so mm. I'd go ahead and cut them off. They'd be on the middle of uh, getting ready to start coming back and I've already cut their time. And I'm like, oh, I'm done, ring the bell. <laughs> but it, it teaches them, you know, you know yes. how WWE was. I mean, you know, if you went over your time, you were in the hot box. God, yes, <laughs> yes you were. So let's yeah. let's go from the beginning, man. Like, uh, yeah. when did you start? Where did you start? How did you start? And give me the whole nine, bro. Uh, so, God, 1988, 
I won uh, my fifth Pan American Games World Grappling Tournament. Oh. And I uh, got my first black belt in Krav Maga. So I was traveling, uh, like doing an amateur boxing with the mm-hmm. AAU. Uh, I was doing that. I was wrestling in high school, did a lot of regional state tournaments, uh, boxed. Uh, like I said, you know what? I actually boxed at the YMCA. You guys familiar with the YMCA in Canada? Up yes. There? Yes. Of course. Okay. Well, YMCA is was big whenever I was growing up, you know, so they had a lot to offer. So took boxing there and did peewee boxing and stuff, you know, and uh, then I got into the martial arts and stuff, uh, the Krav Maga mainly. Uh, Then along the way, you know, did some jujitsu and some Muay Thai and things like that, but I won my last tournament. And then I don't know if you guys, uh, there's a couple of companies over in Japan that invite you over when you start building up a, a nice little record and stuff and want you to come over and fight for them, you know, look, they're, they're more or less Indies, you yeah. know, compared to like K one or UFC or right. anything. They're low, they're, they're pro, but they're lower rankings, you know? Right. So I went, I went over there to Japan with the, like a couple of days after graduation, I went, uh, I didn't go to the beach with everybody. I flew to Japan with my trainer and uh, we, we did a week long tournament there and I met Ricky Morton from the oh. rock and roll express. Yes. And we just started talking and uh, he was like, you know, where are you from? You know, I was like Virginia. I'm, I'm originally from Virginia. And he was like, well, I live in Bristol, Virginia, you know, and stuff. So we just started talking and stuff and he gave me his card and we exchanged numbers. And I don't know. Uh, I went back home and it, it was probably six, seven months later, a local promoter there ran indie shows. Mm-hmm. And they booked the Rock and Roll Express and they booked the Road Warriors and Tim Horner and uh, Killer Kyle. I mean, there was a uh, Terry Funk. Uh, there, there was a load of, yeah, there was a load of stars. And I was working out in the gym and uh, by God, here comes the Road Warriors and Ricky Morton. They come walking in the gym. And he kept staring at me and he was like, man, I've seen this motherfucker somewhere before, you know. So he came up to me and introduced himself. I was like, yeah talk to you in japan he's like oh shit you know so he you know we talked and i went to the show with him that night i you know a little town there's nothing much to do you know so i went to the wrestling show and um just hung out with him and uh really liked him and then there was a couple of more shows in the area you know the next couple of days so just you know went back to the hotels with him and uh, partied with him a little bit you know and stuff and hung out with him and talked to him and I i grew up watching nwa uh, I grew up on the NWA, Mid Atlantic Wrestling, Continental Wrestling, you know, those kind of shows and stuff. So all of these guys I, I grew up watching. So we just hit it off, really. And we were just talking and hanging out. I mean, they wasn't being, you know, they wasn't marking me out or anything like that. You know, they were being sincere and, and really cool, yeah. you know, so didn't use me as a running boy or anything like that. You know, they were just being legit. Uh, the last night, uh, Ricky was like, man, he goes, you still doing that fighting shit? I was like, yeah. <laughs> he was like, he said, man, he said, you too damn pretty. He said, you got a nice body, you got a good look. He said, you could be a millionaire, man, being a wrestler. He goes, he said, you ought to, you know, if you ever want to give that shit up, he goes, give me a call. And he goes, and I'll get you through, the, I'll get you through. And I was like, well, listen, I've already done enough training in my life. I'm not going to pay for any kind of training. And he was like, oh, no, you're already athletic. You're a, you're an amateur wrestler and you're a fucking martial artist and a boxer. Jesus Christ, what else do you fucking need? <laughs> you know, yeah. he says, the only thing I got to do is tell you how the business works. And I was like, all right. So I thought about it for a couple of weeks. Um, I was a welder then. I was a pipe welder. And uh, my dad owned a welding business. And I was working out of the Hershey Chocolate Factory up there. We were building the new Nutrageous Candy Bar line. And uh, I was in, the, yeah, I was in the field, okay, in the middle of summer, about 102 degrees outside, and I'm welding 46 inch piece of pipe up in the blasting hot sun. I'm getting burned all the shit, you know, just get just not having a good day. Me and my dad got into an argument three times. I got fired and rehired three times in that one day. That's how bad. <laughs> <I was>. Yeah. <laughs> so. I just had a bad day. Lunchtime came. I went home and uh, just, I call it divine intervention, you know, because, you know, in your kitchen, you always have that junk drawer, 
with all the business cards and the screwdrivers and yeah. you know all that stuff it's not it's real, usually nowhere near your your utensil drawer you know right. so i went home i was making a sandwich and i went in the drawer to get uh, a knife you know and uh right on top of all the damn silverware was ricky morton's uh business card which i had what you know I hadn't talked to him in a long time. I hadn't got that business card in a very long time, you know? So what the hell was it doing in my damn, you know, utensil drawer, you know, when it wasn't there before. Right. So I just stood there, you know, kind of got myself in a trance. I was unhappy with what I was doing. I'd already gotten a taste of traveling with the athletics, you know, as a, as a martial artist. And uh, I just, you know, I just wanted, uh, that's the life that I wanted. And I didn't want to be a normal guy, working 40 hours, 50, 60 hours a week, you know, and stuff like that, getting burned from the welding rods and shit like that. So I called him up and this all happened in one day. This all happened within a matter of seven hours. Wow. Okay. He called, I called him, he answered and I was, you know who I am? He goes, well, fuck yeah. He's like, yeah. He said, I just had a great time with you a couple of weeks ago. He said, you think about what we talked about? It's like, yes, I did. Cause what do you think? I was like, I think I'd, just like some information, you know, I was like, you know, what, where would I live? What would I do? You know? And he goes, well, you come to Tennessee. That's where it's all at. I'm like, all right. And he goes, you come to Tennessee. I got you from there. I was like, where would I live? He goes, don't worry about it. I got you from there. Well, back then uh, Smoky Mountain wrestling was, was going. Yes. And there was a house uh, that Glenn Jacobs, who wound up marrying the owner of that house, Crystal, uh, you know, came. Yeah. Yes. He married Crystal. Yeah. Uh, she owned a house out in uh, Elizabethan, Tennessee, and then a lot of the guys from Smoky Mountain, when they came in from out of state, they would stay there at the house until they got on their feet, and then they would move and get their own place. And you just kind of, you know, moved the grass. You just picked up around the place, you know, and did, you know, cleaned and did barn work and stuff like that, you know, and as your payment. So, uh, and one day he talked me in, and I was like, okay, I'll do it. So I went back to work. I talked to my dad. Was like, I got my final check from him. I told him I quit. I'm going to Tennessee to be a professional wrestler. And he just thought I was the stupidest son of a bitch he's ever seen in his life. He was pretty much washing his hands of me of that day because of all the bullshit we had that earlier that morning. And uh, so I went home. I called my brother, my sister, and my mother, had them come to my apartment. And I told him, take whatever you want. Just don't leave anything in the house. I got in my car. Drove over to the office. I told him my job had transferred me to Tennessee tomorrow. I'm leaving. I'm sorry. I got to break the lease. Here's my address. So send me the final bill. You know, they were cool. They let me out. And I drove to, from that moment, I drove four hours right there uh, to Johnson City, Tennessee. Met Ricky at a gas station. He took me to the house in Elizabeth. And I met everybody. Uh you remember, uh, you remember New Jack? New Jack lived yeah. there. Uh, yeah, uh, Balls Mahoney lived there. He was Boo Bradley back then. Yeah. yeah. He used to pick his nose and eat his boogers and stuff in front of everybody. <laughs> yeah. He was nasty, man. Uh, Mustafa, New Jack. Oh, there was so many. Brian Logan, uh, Anthony hey. Michaels. There was just so many, so many guys, you know. I got introduced to everybody. I found me a little spot on the floor. Uh, Slept about four hours, and then uh, about five in the morning, Ricky and Robert knocking on the door, grab your bag. All right. So we were walking out, and I drove a little Geo Storm back then. It was brand new, but it was a little sports car. You know, I get good gas mileage and stuff. He was driving this beat-up LTD. The thing all rusted out. Come walking by the car, and he's like, is that your car? It's like, yeah. And he goes, that's a nice-looking car. He goes, that thing good on gas? I was like, that thing's real good on gas. He goes, good. We're going to take it. <laughs> so we took my car. Yeah. Yeah. We took my car, started in uh, Johnson City. We went to Nashville. Then we went to Chattanooga. Then we went to Memphis. We did uh, USW. Well, they did USWA morning TV show, we drove to Pocahontas, to, uh, Arkansas, did a show for USWA that night. Then the next morning, we drove to Cape Girardeau, Missouri, did a show there, uh, Champaign, Illinois, then down to Little Rock, Arkansas, down to Hazard, Texas then to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, back to Memphis, back to Nashville, back to Johnson City. And that was my first trip with wrestling. And I only started the day before. Wow. <laughs> so did they put you yeah, right in the for, ring or, I mean? No, no. For the first year, I just sat in the car. I listened to, they were really, really cool with me. 
Uh, they, I think they did it the right way. Uh, I, I paid my dues. You know, I carried their bags. I watched their gimmicks. I put their pictures out. I hustled for them. Uh, whenever, you know, they took Polaroid. Back then we had Polaroid pictures. That's how old we are, you know. So we took the Polaroids and I would collect the money and stuff. I would watch their match. And then at the end of the night, when we were going to the next town three or four hours away, both of them would start quizzing me. They would be like, did you watch us? When we, Did you see when Ricky started the match? He got that, that beginning fire. Did you see when Robert tagged in? You know, we slowed it down a little bit. When Ricky got back in, it was heat time again. You know, telling the story, you know, building the, yeah. the match, how you build a match, uh, the concept of it, and then, you know, how he sold. You know, did you see? Because one night I was watching Ricky sell at a National Guard armory in Jonesboro, Arkansas, with about 200 people in it. He was getting his ass beat by Bruiser Bedlam, and he retched out to the crowd like that. And, brother, it started a fucking riot. Wow. That was the selling that he was talking about. And, you know, that's exactly what attracted ECW to me uh, when I first went there. It wasn't the high flying because everybody was doing it. <laughs> you know, everybody was high flying. So it didn't really matter. But what, what caught Paul's eye is that he put me out there in a match. Well, because of Rob Van Dam, I'd been wrestling Rob on the indie shows for Greg. Uh, oh, God, what the fuck is his name? Uh, Greg Price. Do you know Greg Price? I heard the name, yeah. Yeah, I used to do a lot of shows for Greg Price in the Carolinas back in early, early days. And Rob was like, I guess, his partner. So him and Rob would set the shows up and stuff, and they would call get guys like Sabu and all these guys to come down and work with Rob and stuff, you know. And um, so that's where I first met Rob. And then me and Rob started working each other. And Rob was like, why are you doing the independent shows, man? You need to come up to ECW. Here's another interesting story. First night in ECW, I was actually in Winston-Salem, North Carolina with Rob. He was flying out the next day to go to ECW in Philadelphia. I drove back five hours from uh, uh, Winston-Salem to Johnson City, Tennessee. My girlfriend at the time, she was already up. And when I back then, ECW came on very late at night. It came on at like 2 o'clock in the morning, 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning on FSN. Um, Shut up. That's my dog. Uh, <laughs> barking and everything. But uh, yeah, so I went home and uh, Rob called me about the time I was coming in. And he was like, did you think about coming to Philly? And I was like, yeah, I thought about it. I was like, damn, that's a long way, man. You know, I ain't get. I'm driving from Johnson City and I just drove from, you know, Winston-Salem. He goes, if you show up, I'll take care of you and I will get you a match. I promise. And I was like, fuck. All right. So I talked to my girlfriend. I was like, so we unpacked and I repacked. I got in the car. I, I was only home about an hour. I wow. sat there. Got Yeah, I got got something to eat real quick. Um, kissed her goodbye, packed a bag and I hit the road. I drove all the way to Philadelphia. I got there about 1030 the next morning wow. and I was tired, bro. I mean, tired. Walked into the Travel Lodge Hotel in South Philly there. I asked, wow. called Rob. Rob came down. I took a nap in his room and everything. Uh, by the time I woke up, everybody was ready to go to the building. I walked in. And as soon as I walked in, Paul Heyman, I mean, I no, no sooner has turned the corner, he looked at me and he was like, I was David. I don't know if you guys know this, but I was David Jericho back then. Oh. And uh, he was like, I was David Jericho before there was a Chris Jericho. Uh -huh. <laughs> I didn't know yeah. that. I knew he yeah. was David Jacob. I didn't know it was before Chris Jericho. I started a, I started in 1989. Right. Chris didn't come out till like probably 91 or something like that, 92 or something like that. So yeah. Uh, but I don't, you know, I don't know where he got his name, but I got my name off of uh, Jericho oh, Temple Shrine. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I, I really don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I got mine from me and Ricky driving down the road in uh, you know the Shriners. Yes. You know, the, the Shriners sure. that helped him. There was yeah. a Jericho Temple Shriners on the side of the road on the interstate. And we were trying to come up with names, like, throughout the whole trip. It was like David Storm, Storm Cash. We was just coming up with all kinds of shit. And then finally I looked over and I was like, David Jericho, like that. And he says, what? 
I was like David Jericho. He's where'd you see that? And I was like that temple over there. <laughs> he was like, that sounds pretty damn good. He said, we'll use it tonight. And that's how it started. I, you, I went from being uh, Davey Morton because we used his last name because we looked so much alike that I was his tag team partner. And he told everybody I was his son. And believe it or not, I went 20 years. And you remember Knobs and Sags, the Nasty Boys? Yeah. We told, we told them that about 20 years ago. And from that moment, they never knew anything different. As, as many times as I worked around them over the years, they never questioned it and they never asked me again. So one night after everybody, we were in Puerto Rico and Ricky just, you know, his name popped up and I was like, yeah, it's like that motherfucker's like a father to me. And he goes, well, that is your father. I was like, no, he's not my father. He's like, are you fucking kidding me? You son of a bitch. <laughs> Slap me across my fucking neck. And <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, so. I mean, that's how it all, I mean, it, it, that's how I got into the business with Ricky and Ricky just took kind of took care of me, man. We went all over the place, uh, got up to ECW, I walked in and uh, Paul was like, David Jericho, how are you doing? I was like, what? This motherfucker knows me. So I was like, how you doing? And he goes, how's Ricky? And I was like, great. I was like, how'd you know that? And he goes, kid, you ever heard of the dirt sheets? He goes, everybody knows David Jericho. I was like, oh, okay, cool. He goes, did you bring your gear? I was like, I did. He goes, good. You're on in 15 minutes. Wow. I was like, wow, 15 minutes. Okay, great. You know, I was like, what do I got? And he goes, you got a six man. I was like, okay. You know, I was like, anything special? He goes, let's see how good you are. Run out there and don't call a spot. And I was like, okay. But I looked over and everybody that I was in the match with was calling spots. And he was like, no, I don't want you to. You're Southern. I want you to do it without it. Just get with them and get their stuff, but I want you to call your shit in the ring. I was like, okay. He said, you're from the South, right? I was like, yeah. He goes, Ricky Morton trained you? I was like, yeah. He goes, you want to have the Rock and Roll Express? I'm like, yeah. He goes, then you know how to call a match in the ring. And I was like, okay. <clears throat> so I did. If you watch it, I, I everything I did, I called right there in the ring on the spot, you know, and stuff. Got into it like a little, you know, a little fluff fluff with J, uh, JT, uh, God, what was his name? JT Marshall. Okay. Uh, he was, a, yeah, JT Smith. I'm sorry, JT Smith. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, I was the new guy. So he thought he, you know, he was like being quite the fucking stiff guy, you know. And I'm like, all right, you didn't know that I'm a fucking black belt, did you, bitch? And a fucking former teenage <laughs> golden gloves boxer. Okay. Yeah. So I let him have his shit, you know. And then I, my turn, I came up and I jacked that fucker's jaw and dropped him, you know. And, <laughs> Then uh, Axel Rodden, he came over there and crashed a chair over my head, which I didn't see it coming. Oh. Uh, I turned around and he, you know, if anybody knows Axel, he laid the shit in. So he laid it in and the chair literally folded onto my head. Oh. And then a guy named Hack Myers came over and tried to get the chair to hit Axel, but he had to literally step on my back and pull it off of my head. Jeez. It gave me cauliflower. Yeah, it gave me a cauliflowered ear <laughs> because it smashed my ears. Yeah, but yeah, that that was the start of it. And uh, at the end of the night, I walked back uh, in the back and uh, walked up to him, and I was like, "Was that okay?" And he goes, "That was beautiful." And I was like, "Okay." I was like, "You want me back in? You know, we come back sometime." He goes, "Yep, I want you back from now on." Wow. He says, "But he says, but here's the deal. Everybody from up here is from the." from up here so everybody drives in we only fly three different people in so you're gonna if you want to be a part of ecw you're gonna have to drive so for the first year i drove from johnson city tennessee to new york to manhattan to maine to fucking chicago to fucking <laughs> texas wow. uh yeah for the first year uh and then they put then they put the gimmick kid cash on me and okay. the very the very day that they called me Kid Cash, uh, that's whenever I started getting a con I signed a contract, uh, got flights, I got everything. So except for the merchandise, because they didn't pay you merchandise anyway. So I didn't worry about it. Yeah. Wow. So that's how it all started. And then started going back to Japan more, you know, with Rob and Sabu and Chris Benoit and Guerrero, Eddie Guerrero and those guys and stuff. So, so what uh, what promotion did you work for in Japan mostly? 
FMW, uh, worked for NOAA a couple of times, worked for New Japan a couple of times, uh, All Japan. Uh, John oh, Laurinaitis shit. was book. Yeah, John Laurinaitis was booker back then. For All Japan, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's how long ago that was. <laughs> yeah. 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 Did you, So let's yeah. talk about Japan, because I, you know, I fucking love Japan. That's, you know, that's my home, so. Yeah. Uh, uh, did you enjoy it over there? You must have. You get some yeah, I had a big, I had a good angle with, uh, you, you know, a guy named Sima? Yes. Yes, of course. Yeah. I had a, uh, first time I went over, I had a three week angle with him. Uh, they, I worked him one night. They liked it so much that they kept us together through the whole tour. Uh, then I went back and uh, Takamichi Noku used yeah. to wrestle him a bunch. Uh, then in FMW, I wrestled Mike Awesome a lot. Okay. And uh, Panara and uh, guys like that, you know, then uh, Sabu. Yeah. Uh, God, uh, who else? Uh, wrestled uh, Terry Funk a bunch of damn times over there and death matches and shit like that, you know. Sweet. Got the yeah, bomb wire, yeah. But it was sweet, though. I mean, those guys were so professional. It looked like a bloodbath, but it wasn't, you know. I mean, it really wasn't. You got scratches Ooh. and stuff. So. Would you say of all the places to wrestle that uh, Japan is – like the level of professionalism is second to none compared to everywhere else. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They are, they, they are very, very, they're over professional sometimes. Right. And in my opinion, you know, like sometimes they're, they're, they're just to the point of you feel uncomfortable professional, you know, I do, <laughs> you know, yeah. Cause you don't know if you're going to piss anybody off over there. You know, it's like right. easy to do, you know, yeah. and you don't know, but I was given the, the word up before I went there. If you, if you work stiff, then they're going to love you. Yeah. back then and yeah. so that that was the first uh sema one of the first things he did uh we i we it was, was it a backdrop yeah i took a big backdrop and i spun around and i was on my hands and knees and about that time he came running up there and he fucking threw the kick luckily i was a martial artist and you can tell when somebody's going to th really throw yeah you know a, a work kick looks differently than a real fucking thrown kick yeah. And if you're in that atmosphere and you're in that industry, then you can tell when it's coming. And I've yeah. seen it coming. He wound up actually fracturing my wrist because I went like that and he kicked wow. me so hard it fractured my wrist. Boom. <clears throat> yeah, he caught me really good. And it also bloodied my nose because it cracked my wrist and then the tip of his boot caught me on the tip of the nose. So it, <laughs> it was, yeah. So it busted my nose really good. And I I I, I gave it to him, but then my turn came up, buddy. I fucking threw some of that Krav Maga stand-up shit on his ass, and I about pulled his ear completely off of his fucking head, and uh, I ripped it down about probably about three or four inches on the backhand side. You can pull an ear off without five pounds of pressure. Yeah, it's easy. Just just pull down. Yeah, you just pull down. It'll come off. You're a big man. Oh, yeah, just hook that son of a bitch and pull it. It will snap right off. Damn. There's nothing. Yeah, it's just cartilage and skin. Right. So that's what I did. I just fucking pulled his ear down and then uh, uh, he tried to like come in for a little shoot on me. So I got him in the front face lock and I took my pinky and I shoved it so far up his fucking nose that it crippled him. You ever done that? <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. I'm going to have to try it now. It will cripple you. It will cripple you. Don't think about that. Just take your pinky, shove it up somebody's nose as far as you can get it and okay. keep shoving. The pressure will make your eyeball feel like it's about to pop out. And if you push hard enough, your eyeball will pop out. Damn. Yeah. And he dropped, he dropped. He, that's when I knew he, I had him because he got really weak in the knees and he dropped, <laughs> he dropped down. And I wasn't even sure if he understood English at that point. I was like, you want to work with me? I'll work with you. If not, I'm going to fucking murder you. And that's all I said to him. <laughs> yeah. And so, did, so let me guess you, you lightened up after that. He, well, it was lighter than what it was. It well, was still well, stiff, but yeah. but I liked it. It was good. Uh, mm -hmm. We didn't talk. We went into the back, and uh, I sat down. And uh, they were getting ready for interviews. They were, you know, one, you know, they like for you to stand up in front of that damn, you know, little wall there, and they want you to yeah. fucking say a quick little interview. Yeah. So I was waiting on them to get set up and everything. And here he come. I was like already unlacing my boots, and uh, he come walking up to me, and he didn't say anything. He just. Uh, tapped me on my shoulder like this and he, he went like that and he gave me the little bow and yeah. was like very good 
and turned around, walked away. And honestly, I worked him probably a dozen times after that. And we never spoke a word to each other. Wow. Yeah. I don't know if he just didn't like me, but he had respect for me or that's just him, whatever it was. But, you know, I didn't press any issues. I didn't press any buttons. I just kept working, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I know. For, uh, I worked with um, some of his young boys, like the, they're called the Strong Hearts now in Japan. And uh, oh, them, yeah. and Irai and uh, uh, Little Fellow. One of yeah, they one of the little fellas that tried that with me, and I just gave him one good chop, and he settled down after that. You know, <laughs> chop, them, chop, chop them right between their shoulder blades, right high on their neck. That'll cut them real quick. Okay. Yeah, that'll 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 wake anybody up. Yeah, man. So okay, so from ECW they shut down, and then you made your way to TNA yeah. before, right? Uh. Briefly, I went to uh, WC. Uh, well, I went to XWF first. Okay. Uh, Hulk Hogan and uh, Jimmy Hart. Yes. And, yes. Uh, and the uh, what was it? The QVC television station. They put up eighty million dollars to run this organization, and uh, so we had a. We were on soundstage, down in Orlando. We did uh, one weeks. Uh, well, we were there about four days. And we taped uh, the whole day, every day. So we had about probably about four or five months of, of actual tapings. And they were trying to sell to the, to the stations. But we were still doing shows and working with other companies. We worked with Carlos over in Puerto Rico, did angles with them. Then we went to Mexico, did a couple little angles down in uh, CMLL. Uh, then we went out west for Terry Funk, who was running some independent shows out there. And we did, you know, did some Oklahoma shows and some Texas shows. And what was really cool about that, we never did any more TV tapings. I did a total of about, I signed a four year, yeah, I signed four years with them. Okay. And I signed for $100,000 a year. Okay. For four years. All right. And we only did, I only wrestled for them eight matches total. And I was under a no compete clause. Jimmy Hart was probably one of the best agents I've ever worked with in my entire life. He got the deal for me. So he got us under a no compete clause. That means if the company went under, under suspicious circumstances, then I could stay under contract and they would have to fulfill my contract. They could either buy me out or I can sit down and I, they could pay me the rest, you know, throughout the whole time. But what happened was China was going to invade India, a part of India where their main storage facilities were because they okay. produced all of their shit in India and they had their production, their distribution and their warehouses all over in India. Well, China was coming in, was going to, was going to take it. So they got a letter from the Chinese government saying you got 48 hours to get all you can get from your factories, but whatever's left over is going to be the property of the people's Republic of China. So QVC is rushing around. We didn't run any shows. The shows that we did have booked, we got canceled because they had to rush over to India and grab all the equity that they could get. They came back and then they took, uh, what was it, uh, 50 million back from the 80 million. <laughs> so they took the 30 million and they, they were basically paying for the TV time, the tapings at Orlando Studios. They were paying for Hulk Hogan. They were paying for... You know, all the big shots that were there, Macho Man, they were paying for you know, everybody. You know, they were giving me a hell of a contract deal. They were, you know, they were they were treating people really good. Uh, but I left there whenever they I got the call. They said there was going to be no more shows, but they were still going to pay me till the end of my contract. I was like, fine. So one month later, I went to W. No. No, I went to T. I'm sorry, TNA. Didn't went it? to uh, no WC, I'm sorry WCW went to WCW oh. yeah went to WCW I did two thunders with them uh the second thunder I wrestled easy money because we had a great little matchup from ECW yeah we burn it burn it down like we usually did uh come back through the curtain and John Laurinaitis handed me a contract he said take this home show your lawyer show your girlfriend if you agree with it sign it if not then have your lawyer send it to us and then we'll see if there's even room for negotiation it's like okay uh so i took it home uh looked it over took it to my lawyer 
It was good. I signed it, faxed it in. Uh, and from that moment on, I was getting a WCW paycheck for about two months. And they hadn't called me. They hadn't done anything. Okay. So I called them. <laughs> I was like, what's up? And he was like, well, we got you set up for uh, Panama City. Okay. We're going to bring you in. We're going to start running you for the cruiser for the light. Head. They had the cruiserweight titles though. So we're going to start running you for the cruiserweight title. And uh, we're going to get you, you know, in there and you're going to be your, you're, you're, you're actually going to win the cruiserweight title. Eventually we're going to run angles and stuff like that, but it's all going to start in Panama city. Great. A couple of weeks go by, get a phone call. Hey, hold off on Panama city. We got some shit going down and we just want to see how it's all going to pan out. We're like, okay. So of course I'm interested. And I watched, you know, the WCW that night and guess what happened? WWE yeah. to yeah. so they came to me and I was already there uh, they, had, they had me come a couple of weeks uh, the very next week to the very next towns and Jeff Jarrett was there he was still with the WCW at that time right. was being on his way out the door but he was still there so they had a meeting with me John Laurinaitis said we want to keep you uh, we want you to uh, go to Cincinnati and we want you to wrestle there until we call you up and you're, we're going to renegotiate your new contract. I had signed a three-year deal for $150,000 a year, the first year, 200 to second year, 250 to third year. Okay. And with a guarantee of winning the light heavyweight title three times inside that three years, that's what Jimmy Hart worked up for me. Okay. Wow. So it was a great, it was a great deal. Well, they wanted to give me $65,000 a year, move to Cincinnati when I'm already at that time, I was already in my thirties. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was, I was married. I had a wife, I had a house, <laughs> you know, I mean, I was established and I was like, wait a minute, hold on. You know, I've been working for already 15 damn years. You know who the hell I am. I mean, right. this is why you hired me in WCW. You know, this is why you are trying to hire me in WWE whenever I was with ECW, but I was under contract and I, I was happy there. I didn't yeah. want to leave ECW, you know, so everything was good. But so, yeah, all that, that came down and I was like, you know what? I talked to Jimmy. Uh, I did a three-way call with him and Hulk Hogan and we talked about it and they just told me that it just didn't make much sense, you know, because when I asked John, I was like, how long would I be there? And he was like, kid, you know, the business kid, you could be there three weeks. You could be there three years. Who knows? And I'm like, okay, well, I think I'm going to have to turn this down because I'm already making a certain amount of money a year for a certain amount of time. Yeah. Since I left ECW, I've been used to making the money. <laughs> yeah. Now you're telling me, and I told him, I was like, I don't care if I sit at home. I mean, I'll go do dark matches for you if you want me to. And I'll put anybody over. I don't care about that. I just don't want to pick up and leave my home. I mean, that means I would have to sell my house because I can't live off of $65,000 a year living in another state, paying for an apartment and paying for a house with a wife in it that, that's going to be mad as hell, <laughs> you know? So I had no other choice. So I, I turned them down and uh, Jeff Jarrett had uh that was Jeremy Borash called me not even not even two or three days later, uh, called me up and wanted to know if I'd come to Nashville. I was like, all right. So I went to Nashville and that's where the TNA started. I was actually living in Johnson City, driving back and forth. I was going to college at ETSU. On Wednesdays, we had pay-per-views. And on Thursday mornings at eight o'clock, I had class. So I had to leave my class on Wednesday. I mean, on, on Tuesday immediately go home, get everything ready because I had to drive straight Wednesday morning, straight to Nashville, which is uh, uh, from Johnson city there. It's about four and a half hours. Right. So I had to drive four and a half hours. Yeah. Get to the fairgrounds, do the show. As soon as my match was over with, I had to jump in the car and I always left with my outfit on sweaty and everything i just wiped off and then i would drive four and a half hours back i would get home i would get a couple hours sleep and then i would go to class the next day well, after my class yeah i did that for about a year and then uh i wound up 
whenever they moved the office to Nashville, uh, fully to Nashville, and then they moved down to uh, Florida, yeah. the show to Florida, I went on ahead and moved to Nashville. Then I transferred my school to MTSU, which is sisters to uh, ETSU. So I went East Tennessee State to Middle Tennessee State. Finished up my degree there, stayed with TNA for about three years, hated every fucking minute of it. Uh, they were oh, shit. just, I hated it. I was just, just the worst company to work for. It really was. Worst company I've ever worked for, you know. Yeah. Was there yeah. issues with pay or was there just? Oh, pay. Uh, just, I, you know, and, and what killed me, I was working with guys I'd worked around before, you know, like Dutch Mantel. He was yeah. the booker. And I've known Dutch for years, you know, and, but their idea was to take guys who were already established with names and they wanted to get the new boys over that they handpicked to be their face of TNA, you know, like AJ Styles. He was absolute, he was an indie worker before he went there, you know, and uh, the America's most wanted Chris, uh, cat, whatever the fuck. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, uh, and then James Storm, you know those guys. Uh, they they just handpicked a, a few set of guys that they wanted to push to the moon, and then they wanted to use guys like me to get help them, them get over because they couldn't get themselves over. Right. They were talented, but they couldn't get themselves over. Right. I don't know if you, if you guys ever watched a couple of the first few shows there at TNA uh, at the fairgrounds. AJ got booed because yeah, he really? did. They, yeah, they like they they liked his moves, mm. but then they booed everything else. They booed his his promos because he sounded like a hillbilly on you know promos at the time. I mean, that at the wasn't time, his strong was, point. Promos were no, never not, his not, strong back point. In the, not back in the day. But then they were like, "Here, Cash, I want you to work AJ. I want y'all to work this angle." Hey, I'm old school. If we're gonna work an angle, then you know what? It's to, up to a pay per view yeah. for a month. I'm going to work a month for this guy. Every single week, we're going to be on TV wrestling each other to the pay-per-view. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, this business, how does that work? Usually the heel beats the shit out of the baby face for those three to four fucking weeks. And then at the pay-per-view, the baby face takes his revenge and then gets the great big pop. Yeah. Well, to them, they didn't want to do that. They wanted him to beat me every single fucking match. And even on the pay-per-view. And I'm like, why are we doing the what's I, what's the point? What's the point oh, in this? And well, Dutch Mantel is a smart booker. He was the one putting that together. Yeah. Well, he was so impressed. Well, supposedly I was at that moment, I was probably the top heel in that company. I was starting riots. I really was. I was starting riots. I was getting followed to my car at the end of the night and getting almost stabbed a couple of times with knives and shit. No bullshit. Got a gun pulled on me in the parking lot. Uh, Ron Killings, fucking uh, Ron Killings and uh, Road Dog, fucking saved my ass on that one. Yeah, I was going to my car, putting my fucking bag in the back of the trunk. And as I turned around, I got some guy walked up, pulled a gun. I says, you want to talk that shit to me now, motherfucker? (laughs) Yeah, Ron Killings. Yeah, here comes Ron and uh, fucking uh, Road Dog, dude. They come down there and kind of got in his way and he got a little worried. He put it down. Then they saved my ass another night, probably a couple, about a year later, a guy tried to pull a knife on me out in the parking lot. Cause I was just that big of a heel. I mean, I was like, I would go back and look at some well, of my stuff. I mean, well, I, I got, I've seen I got, you live. I, I know you, you're a heat seeker, I, brother. I got right, man. So, but that's just the way I was taught. If you're going right. to be a heel, there is no in between. Okay, right. you are the fucking heel, and your job is to piss them people off. That's it. And the best heels can piss off the boys in the back because the boys don't know if you're fucking working or not. Right. And that, right. that was right. me. I'm sure you heard over the years, Kit Cash is a dick. Kit Cash is a fucking asshole. I know I've you've heard, heard it. that. Everybody I've heard, heard it, that. yeah. I always go along with it, but I've heard it, yeah. Yeah, but... My job was to be a heel for me to get right. into that heel from the when I stepped out of that car in the parking lot yeah. and I grabbed that bag out of the car. I was no longer David Cash. I right. was kid fucking cash. That's I it. walked in the building and I was that fucking character until I left that building. And the, sometimes it pissed guys off. Sometimes it didn't. I gave them the option. You want to talk about it or you want to fight about it? Or do you just want to shut the fuck up and walk away? 
That was my turn. Just a sec. I'm going to go take a piss. James, ask him some questions. I'll be right back, okay? Yeah, no problem. Um, <laughs> one thing I did want to talk about, Cash, uh, you had a short run, I know I'm jumping all over the place, but you had a short run tag team with Jamie Noble, the uh, Pitbulls WWE. Pitbull. Why yes. didn't that last longer? Because it was short-lived. It was short-lived because uh, Gary Wolf from the original Pitbulls in ECW, he actually owned the copyright to the name. Right. We were, everybody was under the impression that when Paul sold ECW, he sold all the names. He didn't sell my name because my name was actually copyrighted. Right. The, 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 the night that they called me Kid Cash, I was told by a superstar back there in the back to copyright that name immediately because that, that it's going to do something for you. Because I looked like, me and Kid Rock looked a lot alike back yeah. then, you know, with the yeah. long hair stuff like that so he was really starting to become big and i was starting to become more popular in the ecw with the fans and stuff like that so you know that's how it all yeah but then uh but he uh w when we first got together i was the cruiserweight champion and i was going to stay the cruiserweight champion but uh vince mcmahon was in the gorilla one night and we had a uh he was he was at a pay-per-view and we had a gauntlet match, a cruiserweight gauntlet match. Yeah. And when Jamie got in the ring, all right, him and I, we have the same style. I was more of a high flyer. He was more of a technical kind of guy like Dean Malenko. Okay. But everything else, he's from West Virginia and I'm from Virginia. Right. We kind of came up in the same way. We, we, we actually – we grew up a lot of the same way. We had a really good connection because we were just alike. It was, we both were short. We both were jacked. We both had the little man concept, you know, the little man syndrome. We were both like just pit bulls anyway. I mean, if you said one cross word to us, we both were ready to fight you. I mean, that's just the way we were. I don't know if, if that was we because we felt we had to be that way or what, but that's just the way we were, you know? So when he got in the ring in the gauntlet match with me, we beat the fuck out of each other. He didn't want to, yeah, he tried to outdo me and I saw what he was trying to do. So I out tried to do him. I tried to outdo him. So we were just beating the fuck out of each other. Both of us chopped. Both of us chopped really fucking hard too. So here he goes. He fucking throws the first one. So I'm like, oh, okay, bitch. You know, so I throw one and we start just back and forth. Every blow, the fans were like, ooh, ooh, ooh. And all the other guys that were in the ring, their shit was almost kind of weak, yeah. you know, from what we were doing. So at the end of the match, and then I'll tell you another guy that was tough as fucking nails, that Brian, Brian Kendrick. Yeah. We used to, we used to beat on him and Paul London. And I'm going to tell you what, those are some two tough little bastards. Those guys were awesome. We loved them. We, we loved them to death. We still do. But yeah, those guys were fucking amazing to be so small. They took a ass whipping from us every damn night when we wrestled them and they just kept coming back for more. Uh, but what happened was we actually were going to win at no way out. I think it was 2006 or 2007. I'm really not sure, but no way out. The Eminem was the champions at the time. The hooligans had just lost the belts to the who uh, to the Eminem, and I think there was another team. Yeah, there was there was another tag team that had just started coming out. Casey James, I and Aaron, Aaron who Aaron, Aaron Stevens, Stevens and Casey James. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we got into a little bit of heat. Well, I did with Ricky Steamboat because. Ricky felt that I was disrespecting him, which I felt Ricky should have just been an agent, shut his fucking mouth and let us do our match like we had been doing before. He had just gotten hired and he came in and he's over. He was our agent that night. Well, before that, we had had Regal. We had had Kearns. We had had Arn. We had had Sergeant Slaughter. We had had Blackjack Lanza. We had had a bunch of other and every single one of them. From the time Vince McMahon put us together as a tag team, his very words were like, you two remind me of two fucking dogs. He goes, and that's the way I want you to wrestle. 
He goes, I want you to beat the shit out of everybody you work. And if they have a problem with it, they can come see me. Those were his exact words. I don't want you guys backing down from anybody. I don't want you guys running from anybody. I don't want you guys fucking doing any gay shit. I want you guys to be brutes, bruisers. Go out there and beat the fuck out of people like you did each other. Those, that's what he wanted. So anytime we did our matches, our agents pretty much had already seen our shit and they knew exactly what we were going to do. And they knew that they were trying to push us as heels. So the agents would be like, guys, do your thing. Just let us know the high spots so we can let the, the camera know in the truck. Not a problem. Well, here comes Ricky Steamboat. Ricky Steamboat's Mr. Fucking Technical. He falls in love with Casey James and Aaron Stevens because they look like two 1980s you know, bleach blonde haired wrestlers. And they didn't do anything other than the old school selling and, you know, just kicks and punches. They didn't really have any major moves. You know, they, they were the eighties, you know, kind of guys. And that's, that's the gimmick that they wanted from them. Well, he just fell in love with them because they were eighties kind of guys, you know, well, those guys were the kind of guys that would uh, do a move and then run over there and hug each other and hug each other around the waist and then do the whole butt rubbing thing you know you know what i'm saying and you know and then do that kind of shit you know the funny kind of stuff we didn't do funny stuff we weren't funny we went out there and beat your ass and that's how and so we were trying to call our match around the shit casey james was being a fucking put, uh, punk and he was trying to change the finish around to make right. it look like if they didn't lose so badly yeah, you know what I'm saying? Which I understand, but that was our finishing fucking move. That's just the way it was. I mean, that's how we fired up. That's how we hot tagged. And that's how we ended matches. I mean, that's that's what we did. And uh, so he got with uh, Ricky a couple of different times. And then, well, here comes Ricky. Ricky's like, yeah. Basically, Ricky had to help them call a match to where me and Jamie were bumping our asses off from start to fucking finish. Okay. We yeah. wasn't getting one single iota of any kind of aggressive, you know, forearms and chops or nothing that the, the company wanted us to do what Vince McMahon wanted us to do. He's right. kind of completely trying to change the way we do our matches and what we do. And I'm like, and so I spoke up and I was like, I was like, I'm, I'm kind of, I was like, I, I, with all due respect, I understand what you're saying. I get it. I'm from the South and I came up in that line and stuff. But what Vince has us doing is pretty, pretty much speaks for itself. I mean, we don't do that. That's not what we do. Well, he instantly gets in the ass and tells me I'm disrespecting him. He's a veteran of over 30 years and he's only probably one of the most famous wrestlers in all of history. I mean, he literally told me that, you know, and I'm like, well, you know what? And, and of course, I gained more heat because I don't know when to keep my mouth shut. And I looked at him. I was like, <laughs> I was like, do, do you know what, bro? I was like, you were legitimately, up until today, the my most favorite fucking babyface wrestler of all time. And I was like, and that is even over my own trainer, Ricky Morton, who was probably one of the biggest baby faces in the history of wrestling. But yeah. I chose you over my own fucking trainer. Up until today, I don't like you anymore. You're an <laughs> asshole. I was like, you're you're like you're 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 completely trying to fucking, you know, prima donna our ass, trying to change what we do, because this is what Vince told us to do himself. This is what Vince pulled me and Jamie aside, and this is exactly what I want. I'm not wearing this short fucking hair because I want to. He told me to cut my hair short to look like a fucking pit bull dog. So I showed up the next week with no fucking hair on my head. I had hair, but then I shaved it all off because that's what the man wanted. So now all of a sudden in one night, you're trying to change the whole concept of what our tag team even means, you know? So we did that. I got heat with the fucking office. I got actually suspended for fucking uh, two shows. Yeah. Wow. He, they got me to spend. Arn Anderson walked up to me the uh, the next booking whenever I went the next day to the next show. Arn Anderson walked up to me. He says, "Of all people, you got a fucking insult and disrespect, you Ricky fucking uh, Steamboat." And I was like, "What did I do?" 
So he told me, so I explained to him the whole deal. Jamie was standing right beside me and he agreed to everything. And he goes, you know, he goes, I, I get it. I get it. I was, I, you know, to be honest with you, that's, that's what I thought kind of myself. He goes, but I just wanted to get the story straight. He goes, but here's the deal. He's Ricky Steamboat. You're not. Yeah. He says, you're going to get suspended for a couple of weeks. So just be giving you the heads up. Don't wow. get mad when you hear the news. And I was like, okay. Oh yeah. He went right into the book and the, to the book and meeting and, and was just basically buried me and said that I was disrespectful and uh, I was an asshole and all this other stuff. And, you know, and I was like, okay, whatever motherfucker. So from that moment on, I never even said two words to him. Even if he was my agent, I didn't even, I listened to what he said. Uh, I didn't put any two cents in, but I just went out there and did what I know that I was supposed to do. Right. He would get mad about it. I come in the back. He said, I guess I'm just here for nothing, huh? And I would tell him, I'm like, how come you're the only agent that seems like you need to get involved with the workers matches other than the angles. That's all you need to do is know where the angles are for the camera. That's it. You're not even supposed to tell us how to work, right. you know, but you, but you're doing it. And I have no idea why I'll listen to you out of respect, but I don't have to do what you tell me to do. Right. I was like, D Malenko comes to me all the time telling me that I should do this and do that. Some things I do, but the other shit, sometimes I don't, he don't come and get mad at me about it. He knows that I'm my own wrestler, my own character. He knows that the pit bulls are their own character. We're not like everybody else. We're not supposed to be like everybody else, you know? So yeah. He even liked the, remember the dicks. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> the other one on the show. Oh, he even liked them. He even liked them so much that uh, I got suspended again because the blonde guy told on me for picking on him and I wasn't picking on him. I just was basically telling him he's a punk. He's crying. Wow. He's sitting there crying. Well, you, you know exactly how he was. He was on a couple of those European tours on the buses and stuff and talking yeah. about his mama and shit like that. And uh, he was crying and shit like that. I mean, you're a goddamn pro wrestler and you're a fucking muscled up pro wrestler on top of it. And you're crying. What the fuck? There's no crying in wrestling. Are you fucking kidding me? And so he goes to narcs on me, tell him, telling people that I'm bullying him and shit. So I got suspended again. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so there was you. I listened to one of your interviews, and uh, it's while you were in TNA. It's one of our mutual acquaintances, Mr. Phil Brooks, CM Chump. I mean, Punk. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me the story about when he decides to go into catering and put on one of his hour long matches and watch it and was looking around to make sure everybody was watching his hour long. Oh, match. yeah. Oh, please tell me about that. Yeah, we uh, we used to go to the White Trash Cafe. Right. Yeah. And uh, it was down the hill from the fairgrounds. <laughs> and you always got a meal ticket. So you go in there and you get the meals and stuff. Well, at that mo at that time, he started dating uh, Tracy Brooks. Okay. Who was one of the knockouts. Canadian and, girl. Uh, what is she? She was a Canadian girl from Ontario. Yeah, yeah, she's Canadian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, her and that uh, Ange Angelina girl, uh, yes. they were both. And uh, then there was another one, the 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 bitch. Uh, 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 ODB, ODB. No, no, no. Um, uh, Taylor Wilde. See, I don't know her. I never. I didn't meet her. I never okay. met her. I was already left DC uh, TNA when she came, and then I came back after she had left. So I didn't really know her. Uh, but I know there's a lot of Canadians that came out. Kim Gail Kim. Yeah. Uh, she came down, she wound up going to WWE, but yeah. the other three stayed in TNA. Uh, but yeah, man. But anyway, he, he came down. I think he, I don't know if he was with, had been with ring of honor yet or what? I think, I think so. I yeah. uh, he had just been with him probably, or just right. left him or something, but he came to TNA. He really wasn't there that long. Uh, him and Julio De Niro was a tag. And, uh, so we're down at the, the cafe. He did it on a number of occasions. He didn't do it just once. Uh, he would come down and have his phone and he would literally set up and uh, watch all of his Ring of Honor matches. I mean, but I mean, that's, I guess that's what he did. But <laughs> but he would have his little, you know, little group, you know, and stuff like that. His, his, his girl with him and, you know, stuff. And then uh, 
Yeah, they would just, I mean, it wouldn't bother nobody, but they would just sit there and watch Matt, his matches and stuff like that. And I was even at that time dating a girl that was, uh, when she came in, uh, uh, Christy Richie. Trinity. Trinity, right? No, I hadn't started dating Trinity quite yet. I hadn't started okay. dating her quite yet. I was with a girl named Christy Richie, and uh, she was good friends with uh, Punk's girl. Uh, okay. So when they would come to town, for the TNA, they would always stay at her house. So, of course, she was my girlfriend. So, I was always, she was either my house or her house. So, I was right. there at her house. Next thing you know, uh, one night, here comes Tracy Brooks and CM Punk. <laughs> and I was like, oh, hey, hey, guys. And I mean, we didn't hang out or nothing, I mean, but we were cordial and cool with each other and stuff like that. But the whole time they went into the spare bedroom and the whole time they were in there, guess what they were doing? Watching his batches. <laughs> yeah. But it was fine. I mean, I don't, I mean, you know what? I watched a ton of mine over the years getting started just so I could learn and, you know, and stuff like that. But I also watched a lot of other people's matches, you know, Dynamite Kid and, yeah. you know, Ben Y and uh, fucking, hell, uh, fucking Hart, Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels. Yeah. You know, I watched everybody, including yeah. myself, you know, just so I could get better and see what I was doing that looked stupid and didn't do it no more or if I right. fucked something up, I knew how to do it better, you know, but I didn't do it in front. I did it at home though, you know, where nobody was around. I didn't do it at, at work or in the restaurants or at somebody's house, you know. But, right. And, and look around and make sure everybody's, everybody's watching the, so they can put yeah. you over and tell you how great you are. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you know what? I, back then I didn't like him. I thought he was arrogant and and stuff like that. And I thought he took liberties with people and stuff, you know, but over the years, as you get older and stuff, you know, and you start checking things out, I'm not like a huge fan of his wrestling because I, I never understood. I'm still the, a fan of the old school yeah. where the bigger guys are the heavyweight champions and the smaller guys are the, like the United States champion or the intercontinental champion, not yeah. the heavyweight champion, you know, yeah. Yeah. So I, even though, you know, he did a good job. He did a, he did a good thing in WWE. I just disagreed with him and like Ray Mysterio becoming the heavyweight champion of the world. Right. You know, Benoit could have, could pull it off because Benoit was jacked to the fucking gill and he was so fucking aggressive, you know, oh, Eddie Guerrero, could, Eddie Guerrero could pull it off because he was so fucking jacked up and he was just so athletic. It was just unreal. And he could talk on the microphone like you wouldn't believe, you know, really he was mind, very yeah. talented. Yeah. But you got CM Punk, who looks just like your average guy that sits there, that actually buys a ticket, you know. I call it, I call it the beach test. If you can walk down the beach and turn heads, you know, you know what I mean? That's what yeah, I call it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, it just, well, even, you know, I watched, I don't watch wrestling. And I actually, I've never been, I mean, I watched wrestling when I was a kid, but once yeah. I got into the business, right. only wrestling I watched was my matches just right. so I could get better. Right. I don't watch it now. Every now and then I'll be flipping the channels and there it is. And I'll, you know, hold on for a minute just to see what's going on. Yeah. But I watched WWE a couple of weeks back. I was flipping through and I saw WWE for the first time in like years. Right. And I was just absolutely blown the fuck away. Uh, who's that redheaded kid? Uh, got the beard and Zane, Frankie Zane. Uh, or Sam, Sammy yeah. Zane. Who is it? Uh, Sammy Zane. Sammy Zane? Yeah, he used yeah. to be guy, El, Gen El Generico in Ring of Honor. Yeah. Well, I remember, I remember El Generico. I actually worked him a couple of times years and years ago. But I'm looking at this guy and with his look, without his mask and everything like that. But he looks like my neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> That's a mechanic. He's a skinny, fat, pale guy. He, he, just a mechanic. My, my neighbor is a mechanic who's got frizzy hair like him. He's got the big bushy beard like him and he's got the physique like him. Yeah. I, where did this, what happened? Where did right. this, where did it all change? Right. But see, Punk takes credit for that. He's the one who changed, you know, the, the, the true wrestling fans, the true wrestling fans were able to get up there. The smaller guy could be more entertaining than the bigger guy. So he's the one that actually started the trend. Yeah. My personal yeah. opinion, I think Rey Mysterio 
started that trend, but he came in behind him and did pretty well, you know, and you got to, got to give him credit. I mean, the kid did well in the WWE and I mean, he got to the point where he was so famous that he got to be good friends with Dana White, you know, and got him a couple of million dollar fights. I mean, good businessman, you know, Mm -hmm. it is what it is. I got no heat with the guy, you know? Right. Uh, I just know he was talking shit behind my back to the, all the other boys, so I got heat with him for that. Well, he did everybody. Yeah, he right. did everybody. You know. Yeah. He didn't like me at all. He would nice to me at the building, but then come to find out a couple of nights later from Tracy Brooks telling my girlfriend that he doesn't like me at all. <laughs> I mean, you know, and all because he didn't like me because I was friends with with uh, with uh, Teddy Hart. Oh, That's it. okay. He threw a sword. Teddy Hart. Yeah, so when Teddy Hart would come into the to the states to work do anything for TNA, he would come to my house and he would just okay. stay at my. He's a weird guy, but he was a cool kid. I liked him. I didn't, yeah. you know, a little weird, but yeah. I had to tell him to put a shirt on at the gym a couple of times. He would go to the gym with me and he would take his fucking shirt off in the middle of the gym <laughs> and start bench pressing. And I'm like, ah, Ted, you can't, you can't take your shirt off in the gym, bro. He, oh, you yeah. can't. I'm like, no, you can't take your shirt off in the gym. What the fuck? And plus, you're not even really wearing a shirt. You're wearing a string top that doesn't even cover your body. So right. what's the point of taking it off, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what, crazy, but... what What happened uh, with the WWE run? What was the, the you know, the release? How did oh. that come about? And... Well, they broke us up uh, because uh, Gary uh, Wolf was uh he's he's the owner he was the owner and to the copyright of the pit bulls oh. so yeah and if you go back to that time you'll notice that the cruiserweight division was starting to decrease they were starting to phase out the the, the cruiserweight division okay they started putting a little more emphasis in women's wrestling the ecw uh brand and they were putting more into tag teams. So the cruiserweight division, they put, they took the belt off of me. They put it on Helms. Helms carried it for a couple of months and then he wound, it just wound up phasing out, you know? So yeah. they were pushing us hard. We were actually going to win the straps from m and at no way out. Okay? okay. I think it was, I can't remember if it was 2006 or seven. I just, I can't remember the date, but we were going to win the belts from m and uh, They had just, uh, got the belts from uh, the hooligans, Brian London. Kendrick and Paul London. And yeah. uh, so we were going to go, it was like a couple of weeks to go. We show up for work the very next week that we won our match to make us number one contenders for the titles at the pay-per-view. So we show up to work and we get called into the office. We were told that we were going to break the tag team up because they can no longer use the name Pitbulls uh, so we tried to come up with some stuff. I was like, well, Hey, why don't we just bring Gary in as our manager for a couple of months, let him endorse the name. Yeah. So it makes everybody feel better. And then we turn on. Him. Yeah. Send him, yeah. send him on out. That way he gets a paid couple of, whether he gets a couple of good paydays, he gets another regeneration. Uh, he gets another regeneration on his, his career. You know, um, you know, it would be good for everybody, but they didn't want to do that. They said, no, we're doing it. So they came to me and they said, uh, um, what we're going to do is Jamie, we're going to make you an agent. We're phasing out the cruiserweight. Yeah. We're phasing out the cruiserweight division. So we really, without you being in a tag team, we don't really have any uses for you guys. Okay. So we're going to make Jamie, uh, because of Dean Malenko, we're going to make you an agent and cash. We're going to send you to ECW. Oh. So here's the deal. When I first started WWE, they told me, and this is what Vince told me in our meeting. We do not want to even bring, I don't even want people to talk about that. You were an ECW original. I want you from this moment on to be a SmackDown original. And I'm like, okay, fine. Whatever you want to do, you know, it's fine with me. Well, of course, we do that. We go down to Deep South and start, you know, getting the, getting everything ready and shit like that. You know, 
doing shit down there, coming back up, doing the TV and stuff like that. Finally, they dropped the strap off of me. They're going to put me in the tag team and all this other crap. <clears throat> well, then they come to me and they was like, all right, uh, we want you to go to ECW. Well, here's the problem with the ECW. It was the writing on the wall. My contract was going to be up in about eight months. Okay. Uh, anybody from the original ECW, if you watched, every single person was brought in, jobbed out, and then just kind of let go. They were right. jobbed out to the new guy, to the new yeah. version of the yeah. WWE version. Yeah. You know, I mean, when, come on, man, Matt Hardy being the ECW heavyweight champion, or you, come on, yeah. Matt Hardy. I love the man. I really do. He's a great guy, but Matt Hardy, right. you know, why didn't you keep, why didn't you put it on Rob Van Dam? Why didn't you put it on me? You know, why didn't you put it on Justin Credible? Why didn't you put it on the, the other guys, Taz? Why didn't you do that? We were all there. So all the former, I was the TV champion in ECW. So you could have put, you could have put the title on me. So where was the problem with that? Well, they didn't want to do that. They just wanted to do it. So my contract negotiation came up because after they split us up, I sent it home for a good two months. And then they called me back and they was like ready for the ECW thing. Yeah. And I was like, okay. So they called me back. We go to uh, Montreal and I'm in the, the parking garage. I only have four months left on my contract. Yeah. Okay. So they told me that we were going to resign, but we only had one conversation about it. And that was months before. So nobody had been bringing it up or mentioning it. And you know how they are. They're very prepared whenever they're ready to resign. You. you know, you know about it months ahead of time. Okay. So next thing you know, uh, show up, I'm in Montreal and I noticed that just people are just being a little different. You know, just people just being different. Uh, can't really tell you how, but they just were being different. So I'm in the parking garage. I'm with Batista, Booker T, Rob Van Dam. Uh, God, there was a couple of more guys back there. And, of course, we're, we're 420. We're smoking weed. Batista? Huh? Yeah. yeah no Batista shit. Smoking. No. I never knew that. Yeah, a couple of guys looked at that I didn't realize until I just kind of walked up on them, you know, and we were doing it, you know, but I was cool. I didn't care, but, but yeah, so we're all, we're all hitting it and everything like that. And, uh, cause back then the, the marijuana had, they, they had the drug tests, but they were only charging you for the marijuana. Remember they was charging first. It was like a thousand dollars. If you failed, yeah. then it went up to like $2,000. Yeah. I was just paying the fines. That's yeah. I didn't have a problem with it. So it was just two grand. Fuck it. All right. You only drug test me here and there. So, okay, whatever. Yeah. You didn't suspend me. So I'm good with it. I can still work. I'll pay the two grand. So I did. Uh, but then uh, after Montreal was over with, I got home the next day and I was literally putting my key in the door. Literally had my bag, had my key in the door. I opened up and next thing you know, John Lyon, I just calls me. Hey, kid, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to tell me the truth. I'm like, okay, what the fuck are you doing smoking marijuana in fucking Montreal, Canada, when the faith in Montreal and Canada, they will fucking put you under the fucking jail. That right there puts our company in fucking jeopardy. You're shitting on Vince McMahon. You're shitting on your fucking self. You're dead. I'm like, okay, here we go, Johnny. Just listen to Johnny berate, you know, he did. He berated people and shit like that. So he's just berating me and shit like that. I'm just shutting up listening and everything like that. Well, come to find out, I found out who it was. It was the Brooklyn Brawler. So the oh. Brooklyn Brawler, yeah, a dark. Here's the, uh, so I, yeah, Stu. So I leave the group and I'm walking back. Okay. I get around the fucking corner. Guess who's in the parking lot trying to find people to fucking narc on? Fucking Brooklyn Brawler. Yeah. So he comes walking up to me. He's like, hey, kid, what's up, kid? How you doing tonight, man? He goes, man, I'm sorry to hear about your fucking tag team, man. You, hey, what's that? Good, that's, that's, that's that good shit. What's that smell? Oh, man, turn me on. Turn me on, brother. Come on. And I was like, it's not mine. I was like, if you go around the corner, I was like, you probably find all you want. You know, I was like, right. but it's not mine. I can't hook you up. So right. I directed him. So what 
first thing the motherfucker does is go right back in the damn building, goes right up to John Laurinaitis, Vince McMahon, Pat Patterson, and everybody in the group, and be like, hey, yeah, man. He said, hey, he said, if y'all want the good shit, just let me know. He's like, Kit Cash knows where to fucking get it. He's out in the parking lot. Parking lot. They out there smoking right now. He's like, yeah. But he did, failed, to, failed to mention that Batista, the heavyweight champion, yeah. Booker T, uh, yeah. Rob Van Dam, uh, yeah. all the other fucking guys that were out there smoking too. Okay, so I get this is what he told me. He says, I got to call you back, kid. He goes, I don't know what's going to happen here. So he waits about two weeks. He calls me back. And he says, hey, kid, he goes, I got two things we can do. We can just run your contract out and just leave it at that. Or I can go ahead and let you go for smoking marijuana in Montreal. I was like, what do you mean let me go? I was like, that's not on the drug test. He goes, yeah, it's on the drug test. I was like, yeah, but it's only a fine. He goes, well, here's the deal. I'm going to just tell you straight up. I like, I like for people to tell me straight up, so I'm going to tell you straight up. We got to make an example out of somebody because we're cracking down on the marijuana. That's even going to be a, 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 a fine that's going to be suspension and no pay and all that other stuff. You won't be able to pay the $2,000 fine. That's where we're heading. So we got to make an example of somebody. And I'm like, oh, so I'm the guy. I'm the guy. I'm the guy you're going to make the example out of. He goes, well, here's the deal. He goes, we're going to quietly just you know release you but you're going to get your contract paid. Don't worry about it. You're going to continue to get paid all the way up. Then they get, and you know what? I got to give the man one thing. I mean, he did me great. He, they paid me all the way through and he gave me a severance pay. Oh, wow. of about Gave me a $50,000 severance pay. And wow. he hooked, he hooked me up and he hooked me up. He knew it was fucked up. He even yeah. said he's fucked up because, but I got to do my job like anybody else. This is what Vince said to do. This is what I'm doing. I said, not a problem. So he also shot me a couple of, emailed me a couple of numbers to Japan to call. And as soon as I did, told him, you know, John Laurinaitis, you know, told me to call you and boom, I was, I was already back in Japan doing shows until TNA called me back. And then I went right back to TNA. Okay. For another three years which I shouldn't have done because I hated the first fucking go around, but I went back for... So it didn't get any better uh, the second time around? Oh. Well, the pay was better the second time, but it got bad with getting paid. It got oh. bad. The first time I never got... First time I never had a problem getting paid, it was the problem of getting fucking raises. I walked in the company making $500 a match right. because we're new... We're just getting off the ground. If you can stick it out with us, we'll make sure you get a great contract. Okay. Right. Well, for the first three years, I never got that contract. I got $500 a night and I got rolled over illegally on my fucking contract because you made an eight by 10 of me, which in the contract is state that if they made any kind of merchandise, they had the, they had the right to roll me over. Well, for the, after the first year was up, I let them know that I was going to WWE. I didn't already talk to them. We didn't already talked. I'm ready. I'm ready to fucking go. This is the first time. And uh, so they, when my contract runs out, they rolled me over because they made an eight by 10 of me. Uh, now, given all year long, all year, they didn't make one stitch, not one picture of, of any kind of likeness of me. Until I told them that I was not going to resign and that I was going to go somewhere else three months before my contract ended because they wanted to go ahead and, and what they did is they put the X division title on me thinking that I was a mark for a belt. Right. And that I was, right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not kidding you. The yeah. dude came uh, fucking uh, Bill, uh, the little short guy, man, the little ball headed guy. Uh, anyway, he came up to me and he goes, he goes, that belt looks really good on you. And I was like, thank you. And he goes, he goes, I guess you're going to want to stay now, huh? And I was like, no. I was, kind of wondering, I was kind of wondering why you put the belt on me. I'm leaving in a couple of weeks. You right. know, I'm not going to resign. And he goes, he goes, oh, well, that doesn't make you want to stay. And I was like, this belt? He goes, no. And I was like, I want, I want money. money. I had a couple extra couple zeros money. to my fucking paycheck. Then I'll stay, right? Yeah. I was like, Bill. Do you seriously think, or are you that big of a mark to think that I can take this belt to the grocery store 
and buy groceries with it. Exactly. And, exactly. and still walk out around and still walk out with it around my waist. Right. You know, can I go yeah. to the power board and pay my power bill and still walk out with it around my waist? <laughs> I was like, no, it don't work like that in the real world. I was exactly. like, kid, I've been doing this shit. And, and I think at that time I've been wrestling like 18 years. And I was like, I was like, Bill, I've been doing Bob, Bob Ryder. I was like, Bob, I've been working for 18 years. I quit being a mark the first year. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, yeah. He's like, well, we, well, we really need you to stay. I was like, no, you really need me to get beat every fucking night and put guys over. That's what you need me for. And I'm not doing it. So Dutch Mantel walks up to me. He says, I don't understand why you have a problem with the way we're, we're running you. We're putting you over bigger and shit. He goes, and, I, and I'm kind of wondering, as long as you've been in the business, it kind of, you can't see that. And I was like, yeah, I'm losing every single night, every night. He goes, yeah, but we're giving you the most TV time, the most promo time. He goes, you're such a good heel that you don't realize that you could lose every single night and it wouldn't affect you. Right. And I was like, I get it, but that's, I'm not ready for that. I'm still young. I'm still want to work. I still want to be champion. I still want to fucking make money. I don't want to fucking be a fucking second fiddle to some young kid that doesn't know how to get himself over. Right. So that was the deal, you know? Yeah. So that's why I didn't like TNA the first time. But the second time we got paid better. But yeah. after the first, after the second year, my check would uh, be late. Like a lot. Uh -huh. Like, uh -huh. like we can check it out. They would, uh, I wound up having to sue them after I left for about okay. 14 grand because they didn't and give you back pay. pay. Yeah, back pay. Oh, you know what, man? Like so money. many, so many people have asked me, like, "Oh, well, why didn't you go to TNA, dude? I had a full time gig in Japan. You've been in Japan. If you had a full time Japanese gig, would you give that up to, for any American company? No, you've been there. You've the been a wrestler. The, the the first run I had with them, the only thing that was saving me financially is yeah. that I still had that contract with fucking the Home Shopping Network. I was making $1,500 a week, every single week for three years. And I never worked but eight matches for the whole entire company. Okay. And, and technically still on the books, I'm the X division. Uh, I'm, I'm the XWF cruiserweight champion. Never was beat. <laughs> so, yeah. I won it and, there, and defended it about eight times and never lost it. And the company shut down and I kept getting paid for three years. So making that $500 a match was good because I would do two matches a weekend with TNA. And then I made my $1,500 a week sitting on my ass, you know, with the other company. I did. That's why I didn't mind it so much when I was there the first time. But after that ended and I went to WWE, I came back, went back to TNA. And then, yeah. like I said, the money was better. But then they got to the point where they would go three or four weeks without paying you. Well, right. then they would pay you, and then they would go another three or four weeks without paying you, and then they would pay you again. Well, then they would never back pay you. Oh. So I'm like, okay. I was like, bro, I get paid every week, not every three weeks. Oh, well, don't worry. About it. Yeah, well, you you get your check. And I was like, okay. So when my contract came up at the end of that, I just walked in and told Al Snow, I was like, hey, I got about a month left on my contract. I really don't want to be here anymore. Can I just go? <laughs> he was like, dude, did that ever happen to you in WWE where they pay like back pay? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I, I, like you'd get a royalty check, right? I got a royalty check and then I wouldn't get paid for a week, sometimes two. And then when I call up the, uh, the account, they overpaid you. Yeah, they overpaid you. Well, yeah, because you know, the royalty checks was like a big, you know, five figure amount or whatever, right? Yeah. And then mm -hmm. I wouldn't get paid for like a week or two. And then I actually called the accountant and then he cut a promo on me. Like, yeah. listen, you just made ten thousand dollars. You know, but I'm not <laughs> complaining. I'm just saying, don't I supposed to get a paycheck every week? Maybe you missed the. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that I, that was the first and last time I ever called yeah. that. Yeah. Oh yeah, I did the same thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I even uh, when I when I first signed with them, they they didn't bring me in for almost a month. Okay. And they were paying me every week. Okay. So when I made it to TV, when I got up to TV, John Laurinaitis uh, told me, he was like, uh, so we've been paying you for like, what, a, a five, six weeks now? Yeah. I was like, yeah, about five weeks. And he goes, okay. 
he wrote it down. I go home. And usually when I would go home, because I was on SmackDown, so I would be home on Tuesdays. So whenever I get home on Tuesday morning, my mail was always waiting on me because I always got my wrestling check on Mondays. So right, I was always right. waiting on me. So same yeah. thing. I, but I, when I walked up to get my check, there was no check in it. And I was like, what's going on here, man? You know, so I called the office. He goes, yeah. He goes, back pay. I was like, what do you mean back pay? He goes, yeah. He goes, we've been paying you and you haven't been working. <laughs> Dude, there's so many stories. I think that's all it tests, though. <laughs> like, they test you it in was, so many different ways, right? It was. They weren't because I was already known for losing my, my cool and blowing my top. And John oh. Laurinaitis, literally, the when I, when they flew me to Connecticut and I had the meeting with them, John Laurinaitis, after our meeting, pulled me to the side. And he was like, I got to have a talk with you. And I was like, okay. He goes, the reason you got a job here is because Vince likes your attitude. He goes, I don't know why. I don't like it. He goes, he goes, but you wouldn't make a good heel because nothing would piss me off more as a little short guy with a big attitude. You <laughs> told you that for a shoot? Yeah, for a shoot. Wow. And I was like, okay. He goes, but here's the deal. Your, your attitude got you your job. He goes, but I'm going to tell you right here, right now, and we're not going to have this conversation ever again. You better know where to put that attitude. Uh, and I was like, okay. Whatever, dude. Yeah. I, I don't give a fuck what you just said. <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking about it. I, don't give a fuck what you just said. I just signed a damn contract with WWE. Fuck off. You know? Uh, well, yeah, brother, he was always like that. Yeah. yeah he was I always a little bit of guy. Yeah. I, I got a lot of stories about that guy, too. But you know what? We've been talking for an hour and a half. I said 40, but dude, you're such a great storyteller. Oh, uh, would you like to come back <laughs> on again, maybe in a couple months, three, four, five months? Check out, let me know, man. Talk some Absolutely. more. I mean, you got a Jesus Christ, what, 20, 25 year career? More? 30. 30 oh, year 30. career. So it's hard to get that just one, <laughs> one podcast. But uh, we're going to start oh, doing live yeah. QAs uh, coming up. Cool. So, like, I'd love to have you back on so we can interact with the fans. Is that cool with you? Beautiful. Sounds great. Hey, brother, thank you so much for coming on, and uh, we'll keep in touch. All right, brother? Absolutely, bro. All right, man. Take care, man. Thank you again. All right. Bye-bye.